Good evening, uh, everybody, and uh, welcome to, to Trento. So good evening for those who are attending from the same uh, um, from the same time zone. And um, it's a pleasure to have you, although only uh, uh, online uh, in Trento. Um, um, ladies and gentlemen, and, and, and dear Professor Copeland, um, I'm deeply uh, honored to welcome you all on behalf of the Center for Religious Studies and Fondazione Bruno Kessler uh, in its entirety. Um, uh, first of all, I, I wish to convey uh, the special greetings uh, from our President Francesco Profumo and Secret Secretary General Andrea Simoni. Um, thank you all for joining uh, tonight. We are uh, gathered uh, for our annual lecture. In annual, uh, our annual lecture is named after Davide Zordan. Uh, I wish to um, open uh, this event uh, by welcoming and thanking very warmly his family, uh, which has been a constant reference for our community and a very, very dear part of it. Davide embodied the soul of our institution and community. Uh, I have known him only through the memory and the witnessing of his colleagues and friends. I acknowledge his inspiration in the hard, sensitive, responsible work as well as in the creative, innovative, and at the same time, uh, uh, rock-solid research on religion in its interaction with the challenge of our time. I reaffirm our commitment to stay true to his legacy, which we see indeed as our legacy. Uh, before giving the floor uh, to the uh, master, uh, to the master of, of, of the event, Paolo Costa, and to our um, guest speaker, Professor Sean Copland, let me express my gratitude and on behalf of everyone, our gratitude to both of them. Dear Professor Copland, uh, you indeed honor us with your lecture. Thank you so much uh, for having accepted our invitation and for having identified, actually proposed, such a timely and fundamental question. Are we civilized enough to sustain a civilization? As the theme of your lecture. I also thank you very much for the preparation of the text, which we are eager to see published as soon as possible, and for your willingness uh, to share your knowledge and wisdom with us tonight. Year after year, and this is already the fifth year uh, since the inception of the Zordon Lectures, uh, Paolo Costa has been leading this initiative with his unique blend of intellectual strength and human depth. I thank him very, very much. Um, a word which is not in the text, so I will myself uh, uh, say this in Italian as well, for Isabella Mazé and the old, uh, and the old staff uh, here at FBK and Annalisa Armani for their uh, great job and commitment. If this is possible, it is indeed thanks to them. Quindi grazie, grazie mille. Quello che sto dicendo eh, non, è, non era previsto. Uh, a Isabella Mazé, um, Annalisa Armani e, e tutto lo staff che ha consentito uh, questo evento. Um, Paolo Costa, now I leave the floor to you as the chair of the event, looking forward uh, to your introduction to the lecture and the Q&A. And again, thank you, thank you so very much. Thank you for your kind words, Professor Ventura. So good evening to everybody. 
Welcome to the fifth edition of the Davide Zordan Lecture. The Zordan Lecture is an annual event organized by the Center for Religious Studies of the Bruno Kessler Foundation to honor the memory of Davide Zordan, a researcher of the center and a dear friend who prematurely died a few years ago. Uh, the invited speakers are scholars committed to renovate in theology so that theology can live up to the challenges of the present. Uh, to begin with, let me extend a warm welcome to our speaker, Professor Sean Copland, who is connected with us from the United States. She's a professor emerita at Boston College and holder of the McDonald Chair at Emory University. A frequent lecturer on college and university campuses, she addresses topics related to theological anthropology, political theology, social suffering, gender, and race. She is the author of Inflation Freedom, Body, Race, and Being, and the subver subversive power of love, the vision of Henriette de Lille. Copeland has been the recipient of several awards, including the Yves Kungar Award for Excellence in Theology from Mary University. She is a member of many academic societies, such as the Catholic Theological Society of America, the American Academy of Religion, the Society for the Study of Black Religion and the Black Catholic Theological Symposium. We would have very much liked to have her here with us physically today. History with a capital H, though, doesn't care much about individual wishes. So due to the ongoing health emergency, the lecture is held this year in the now familiar format of the video conference. The painful circumstances in which we find ourselves, however, at least have the advantage of giving even more prominence to this appointment, which I would describe as the third and final chapter of a trilogy dedicated to the topic of salvation. After Clive Marsh's search for traces of the Christian idea of salvation in today's popular culture, and Susan Ross' reflection on the non-contingent link between beauty and salvation, we will touch on the question with which people are called willy-nilly to come to terms these days. Are we civilized enough to sustain a civilization? In other words, if what we aspire to as human beings is not to fall back into a state of barbarism, what hope is left for us if the very division between civilization and barbarism has often been a vehicle of barbarism itself? Anyone who knew him personally knows that Davide was quintessentially civilized for his kindness, his grace, his elegance. In his intellectual research, however, he was at pains to convey the idea that what saves us goes way deeper than that. In fact, his curiosity was drawn to everything that never reaches that level of order to what simmers under the Apollonian surface of life, even if it is not immediately constructed as Dionysian. Son of his time, Davide investigated this dialectic between order and disorder in art, especially in the art of cinema. And it is precisely there that he tried to understand such never ending dialectics as the symptom of a deeper order, an order that collides with the most superficial civilizing forces 
of the modern liberal dispensation. Basically, if we think about it, what David tried to do in his theological work was to reconcile Christian realism, which is a realism of the person in flesh and blood, with the colossal gospel hopes of a transformation of the human condition, so radical as to put our own imagination in crisis. My impression is that his favorite synthesis involved a judicious blend of activity and passivity, rebellion and acceptance, pride and humbleness. Even if I concede the nature of that measure is obviously the intricate bundle that theology, but not just theology, is asked to disentangle. Luckily, it is not up to me to tackle this difficult issue. I am happy, therefore, to give the floor to Professor Kaplan, thanking her again for her kindness and support. At the end of the lesson, there will be time to ask her questions. Questions in English or Italian can be sent to me either by using the comment space on YouTube or by writing an email to segreteria.isr at fbk.eu. Yes, the time now has come to enjoy this very special edition of the David Zardown Lecture. Sean, the floor is yours. Grazie. Buonasera. Good evening uh, to everyone uh, gathered here in this virtual space. Much has happened between April of 2019 when the invitation to give this lecture was offered and now December 2020. Our world has changed, but not perhaps changed radically enough. Globally, the coronavirus has terrified us, turned us inward, isolated us, and in some places, turned us against one another. Our hope and our future as God's human creatures lies in our decisions to cooperate and collaborate with one another, to put aside disagreements, to choose solidarity, to choose life, the more abundant life held out to us by the one who is holy mystery, God. My heart goes out to all of Italy as your physicians, nurses, specialists, and healthcare workers labor to stop the spread of the coronavirus. Italy, I think, belongs to the entire world, especially to those of us with a stake in the future good of Western civilization. I offer prayers for all those who have died for the consolation of their families, loved ones, friends, colleagues, and neighbors, and for all who suffer with or are recovering from the virus. I thank Dr. Paolo Costa of the Center for Religious Studies of the Bruno Kessler Foundation in Trento for the gracious invitation to give the David Zordan Lecture, and I thank the members of the board of the foundation for considering me. It is honor it is an honor to be invited to Trento, even if this is a virtual visit. And I thank Dr. Costa for translating the talk, and I thank Dr. Massimo Fagioli for his advice. Also, I am grateful, grazie, to Signora Isabella Masse and the staff for organizing the details associated with the lecture. Signora Masse has been most patient and kind in helping me through so many complex forms. Are we civilized enough to sustain a civilization? The coronavirus disease, a highly pathogenic viral infection caused by SARS-CoV-2, has brought massive suffering and grief to our world. COVID-19 defies punitive immunities of every kind. 
despoiling children, youth, women and men, irrespective of nation or race, culture or tongue, wealth or privation, virtue or vice. At the same time, this lethal virus has thrown us all into a poignant solidarity, shared suffering, death and loss, as well as the disclosure of cherished human values, love, compassion, and joy. Physicians and nurses, specialists and technicians have spent themselves relentlessly, some even to death. Healthcare workers have sat beside dying patients holding a phone or tablet so that they might bid loved ones farewell. Others cleaned hospital rooms of COVID patients when maintenance staff were too fearful to enter. Scientists and medical researchers have worked feverishly to research, experiment, test, prepare, and now make available a vaccine. Still in his address to the United Nations General Assembly special session in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Secretary General Antonio Guterres cautioned, cautions bluntly, a vaccine cannot undo damage that will stretch across years, even decades to come. Are we civilized enough to sustain a civilization? This provocative question was posed by my pastor, Father Oscar Pratt II, in a homily live streamed during the seventh week of suspended in-person celebrations of Eucharist due to the spread of the coronavirus. Are we civilized enough to sustain a civilization? The question shook me. I heard it first with the ears, heart, mind, and intellectual formation of a Catholic theologian, a person of faith whose concern is the mediation of God's meaning to the whole of God's creation, especially God's vulnerable, despised, and excluded human creatures. My theological research and writing take shape as political theology. This framework for theology has nothing to do with the endorsement of government politics or advocacy of partisan and political parties. Rather, most fundamentally, political theology seeks to safeguard the life, dignity, and flourishing of human persons, particularly those constructed as social others. To this end, political theology probes intersecting global power dynamics and relations that shape not only our technology, but those cultural, economic, and geopolitical configurations that flow from these. At the same time, political theology pursues and advocates for collaboration among all people of goodwill and bringing about conditions for human and social transformation. As a Christian exercise of political theology, this lecture is rooted in a perspective and takes a stance and a stand at the foot of the cross of the crucified Jew, Jesus of Nazareth. The perspective and the stance are grounded in a desire and commitment of heart and soul, mind and strength to follow Jesus, even if haltingly and fitful. The memory and meaning of his life and ministry death and resurrection shall never be exhausted. And in this moment, critical interpretations of the crucifixion of those children, women, and men whom he names as members of his family have never been more necessary. Are we civilized enough to sustain a civilization? I also heard the question with the ears, heart, mind and life experience of a person, a woman who has been racialized as black in a misogynist and anti-black societal disorder. For women, especially poor women, regardless of race or ethnicity, for all people of color and immigrants and refugees, particularly in my country, for gay and lesbian and transgender people, for children, youth, women, and men with disabilities of all kinds. For black people, certainly in my country, this question is a matter of life and death. 
I recognize the difficulty of speaking about race outside the United States. Let me say there is only one race, the human race. But because of more than 200 years of racial enslavement in the United States, race was used and still is to refer to skin color. On a technical and scholarly level, race denotes a social construct. Race is one of many ways to conceptualize, to organize, to manage, to control, to rule social worlds comprised of persons whose differences allow them to be arranged into groups that come to be called races. Are we civilized enough to sustain a civilization? This question was addressed by a black Catholic priest to parishioners, nearly all of whom are black, of African, African-American and Caribbean ancestry. This question put so seriously by Father Pratt to us demanded our response as disciples of Jesus of Nazareth. It demanded us to examine our consciences, our attitudes, our lives, our actions. This question demanded us to commit ourselves to cooperation for the common good of all, to active and compassionate solidarity. Are we civilized enough to sustain a civilization? In this moment of global suffering and anguish, this question presents a challenge. So I want to think with you all, all of you gathered here together from many places about the challenge this question poses for the life and flourishing of all species of planet Earth. For the sake of clarity and convenience, I have arranged these remarks in three parts. First, I will review a few definitions of civilization. Second, uncover the material suffering that impacts us human creatures, especially the most vulnerable members of our common home. And third, ponder what might be required of us to become worthy of our human life created in the image and likeness of the divine, the Imago Dei, to consider that to which we are called so that we might become worthy of our planet, to reflect upon that to which we are summoned so that we might become worthy of one another. Notions of civilization. <clears throat> Civilization, the word evokes grandeur, splendor, weight or power, perhaps even magnificence. We might recall that the word civilization derives from the Latin word for city, civitas. Almost always great civilizations had great cities whose intricacy, efficiency, and beauty revealed basic features of civilization. As a North American invited to speak to Italians, the meaning of civilization for me cannot but resonate with Rome, Roman civilization. And of course, within the history of the Roman Catholic Church, Trento is no insignificant city. There are multiple ways to identify and define civilization. Anthropologists, archeologists, and social historians would agree that civilization includes at least these characteristics, a stable food supply, social structure, system of governance, literacy, education, specializations, technology, leisure, culture, art and architecture, and religion. Writing in the late 19th century, English philosopher and theologian John Henry Newman concluded that, quote, civilization is a state of secular mental cultivation and discipline with A, creativity and art, B, sociability and political stability, C, intellectuality, and D, reluctance to use force. Newman was not so much concerned with the products or artifacts of civilization, as with its orientation of mind and body. The research of French sociologist Marcel Mauss, who worked into the middle of the 20th century, crossed between sociology and anthropology. 
he argued for a notion of civilizations, plural, and did so in terms of encounter and, quote, circulation between societies of their various goods and achievements, close quote. Mouse maintained that, quote, societies live by borrowing from each other, but define themselves rather by the refusal of borrowing than by its acceptance, close quote. Stefan Fuchtwang and Michael Rollins, in their retrieval of Mouse's insights, affirmed the dynamism, malleability, or plasticity of civilizations as expressed through their inclinations to spread, combine, change, transform, to quote, force us to think and to infer how elements of a culture or society carry within them habits of relating to others, practices and ways of making things, differentiating itself from other cultures or societies in a similar manner, close quote. In the closing decade of the 20th century, American political scientist Samuel P. Huntington advanced a controversial, perhaps notorious thesis, the clash of civilizations. He identified civilization with culture, focusing as Newman did on quote, common objective elements, such as language, history, religion, customs, institutions, and by the subjective self-identification of people, close quote. But Huntington's antagonistic division of the geopolitical world into, quote, the rest versus the West versus the rest, close quote, exhorted non-Western civilizations, quote, to acquire the wealth, technology, skills, machines, and weapons that are part of being modern, close quote. At the same time, Huntington urged the West, quote, to accommodate non-Western modern civilizations whose power approaches, close quote, that of its own. Huntington concludes, this will require the West to maintain the economic and military power necessary to protect its interests in relation to these civilizations. It will also, however, require the West to develop a more profound understanding of the basic religious and philosophical assumptions underlying other civilizations and the ways in which people in those civilizations see their interests. It will require an effort to identify elements of commonality between Western and other civilizations, close quote. But Huntington offered a self-serving or bent advice to non-Western civilizations, since accommodation would only enable the West to continue to hold primacy. Huntington's formulation landed during the early and heady days of post-colonial and decolonial studies. Both the essay and the subsequent book met with sharp criticism. It's thinly veiled advocacy for modernization, we should read assimilation, hazards reinscription of the meaning and dominative notions of civilizing and being civilized, of discovery and being discovered, of colonizing and being colonized, of colonizer and colonized. Given centuries of trade in human flesh, colonialism, expropriation, even genocide, meanings of the term civilized are highly charged. The admonition to behave as if one is civilized may mediate both parental exasperation and denigrating insult. In the context of Father Pratt's homily, the term insinuated failure to comply with the biblical injunction of love of God, love of neighbor, and that piety that directs us to the common good. Let me turn now to the global material context. The dynamics, conflicts, and contradictions 
of global neoliberal capitalism have thrown us all together. We peoples of the earth with our differing and differentiated civilizations or cultures, religions, practices, feelings, fears, hopes, ways of daily living. We have been enticed and coerced into a common space generated by an economic system, and I quote here Anzel Min, that both represses and homogenizes us, even as it too often sets us in opposition one to another. Further, the intensification of the ecological crisis radically clarifies humanity's fundamental unity in difference and raises the stakes for the ongoing survival and life of all species, including the human. Ecologist Mark Burtness observes, quote, civilization is generally considered the triumph of humans over nature. And yet, rather than leading to general human welfare, this triumph, which has existed for only 2% of the time that Homo sapiens had been on Earth, has led to stark and very serious outcomes, close quote. Perhaps we are not civilized enough to sustain a civilization. Research conducted by the United Nations and the World Bank indicates that one half of the world's poor live in fragile, conflict-affected, violent states. And in 10 years, up to two-thirds of the world's poor could live in such states. At the end of 2019, 79.5 million persons were forcibly displaced from their homes, villages, and towns. An estimated 30 to 34 million of these persons were children under the age of 18. Obviously, during these crises and displacement, children, adolescents, and youth are at risk of exploitation and abuse, especially when they are unaccompanied or separated from their families. More than 77% of refugees have been displaced for at least five years, and more than two-thirds of all refugees worldwide come from just five countries, Afghanistan, Myanmar, South Sudan, the Syrian Arab Republic, and Venezuela. Poverty remains the scourge of our world and along with war, the chief cause of hunger. Again, according to the United Nations and the World Bank research, roughly 689 people live on less than $1.90 a day. At higher poverty lines, 24.1% of the world lived on less than $3.20 a day and 43% on less than $5.50 a day in 2017. In 2018, four out of five people below the international poverty line lived in rural areas. Half of the poor were children. Women represent a majority of the poor in most regions and among some age groups. About 70% of the global poor aged 15 and over have no schooling or only some basic education. Almost half of poor people in Sub-Saharan Africa live in just five countries, Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Madagascar. More than 40% of the global poor, concludes the World Bank, live in economies affected by fragility, conflict, and violence. And that number is expected to rise to 67% in the next decade. Those economies have just 10% of the world's population. Further, Again, according to the World Bank, many people who had barely escaped extreme poverty could be forced back into it by the convergence of COVID-19, conflict, and climate change. A preliminary estimate for 2020 
incorporating the effects of COVID-19 pandemic, projects that an additional 88 million to 115 million people will be pushed into extreme poverty, bringing the total to between 703 and 729 million. Further, the United Nations report predicts that, quote, the new poor probably will be more urban than the, than the rural poor, be more engaged in informal services and manufacturing and less in agriculture, live in congested urban settings and work in the sectors most affected by lockdowns and mobility restrictions. Middle income countries such as India and Nigeria will be significantly affected. Middle income countries may be home to 82% of the new poor, close quote. Yet, consider that 20% of the world's population reside in the affluent Northern Hemisphere and receives 60% of the world's income, engages in 80% of the world's trade, four-fifths of the world's health spending, and consumes 86% of the world's goods. This group consumes 45% of the world's meat and fish, 58% of its energy, 84% of all paper, 85% of all water, and own 87% of all the world's vehicles. Consider that increasing tendencies of Polio and polio-like diseases, along with tuberculosis, have reawakened old plagues in new places. To quote uh, Jacquino Azito, despite, quote, tens of billions of dollars spent on HIV AIDS research, Africans and indigenous and poor peoples of all races still die in large numbers, close quote. In a remarkably comprehensive study, of the crushing impacts of globalization and its connection to colonization, South African theologian Julian Kuhne states, quote, underdeveloped and formerly colonized countries cannot generally benefit from capitalism because they are undermined by colonialism and slavery. Intrinsic precursors to the spawning of capitalism, globalization ensures a speedy race to the bottom since workers are forced to work much harder for, low, for lower wages and compete with low wage earners employed by transnational corporations who invest heavily in low wage zones, maximizing profits in one location and moving on to a cheaper one when it is more profitable to do so, close quote. We in the United States can no longer evade confrontation with historical, cultural, and social problems with embodied human difference. According to a CBS News report, in the first eight months of 2020, 164 Black youth, women, and men were killed either at the hands of police or their designated agents or under suspicious circumstances while in police custody or during police tactical responses. Since 2015, self-anointed vigilantes and white racist supremacists have killed 92 women and men because these human beings were identified as black, Jewish, Latinx, gay or lesbian or transgender. More than 600 Central American children have been separated from their parents in the attempt to cross the US-Mexican border. Quite likely most of these children will never see their parents again. And on May 25th, 2020, George Floyd an unarmed 46-year-old African-American man was killed during his arrest as police officer Derek Chauvin knelt on his neck for roughly eight minutes and 46 seconds, 
Floyd's murder was filmed on a mobile phone as he died, and its posting galvanized outrage and protest around the world. Are we civilized enough to sustain a civilization? Children, youth, women, and men who constitute social others are weighed down by anthropological impoverishment, ostracized from the category of the human. Neither their persons nor their needs matter at all in the manner in which our world's resources are distributed. It will not be any different in the distribution of life-saving vaccines, or will it? Our world has become a dumping ground, a zone of social abandonment. For the many, the many whom we have made wretched, their suffering is evidence that we have lost all trappings of civilization. We have lost our humanity. We have become our own idols. To quote Václav Havel, as soon as man began considering himself the source of the highest meaning in the world and the measure of everything, the world began to lose its human dimension and man began to lose control of it. A new spirituality for our time, the third part. The gravity of our global situation cannot be overstated. To return to the comments of UN Secretary General Guterres, the virus's exploitation of, quote, long-term fragilities, inequalities, and injustices, close quote, will have sustained transgenerational impact. It is time, Guterres said, quote, to reset, close quote. But how? How to reset? Are we civilized enough to sustain a civilization? Are we civilized enough to live differently? Live against the grain? Live with courage and witness, solidarity, compassion on the side of the vulnerable, despised and excluded human persons? how to reset. The gravity of our situation is material, but perhaps more importantly, it is spiritual. In other words, the fault is in ourselves, in our inability, indeed refusal, to grapple with the fundamental nature of human existence, our essential connectedness to holy mystery, the divine transcendent God to one another, to all creation. Perhaps on this feast of St. John of the Cross in the year of our plague, we might think of Albert Camus' character, Jean Tarou, his desire to learn how to become a saint. And is not such learning and living civilizing? In this section, I want to lift up some insights from the writing of Carmelite theologian Constance Fitzgerald, who suggests, quote, we need a new spirituality for our time and in between time. Who is the God who will accompany us if, as some suggest, there looms on the horizon for the inhabitants of this earth an era demanding a change of consciousness more radical than we can imagine, close quote. Sister Fitzgerald proposes that our contemporary experience of breakdown in society and culture is redolent of what in Christian spiritual tradition is known as dark night, or what in the social domain may be named impasse. The societal and existential experiences that shape our 
global material context reflect and open onto profound impasse. Impasse refers to a situation from which, quote, there is no way out of, no way around, no rational escape from what imprisons us, no possibilities in the situation. Every normal manner of acting is brought to a standstill. And ironically, impasse is experienced not only in the problem itself, but also in any solution rationally attempted. Every logical solution remains unsatisfying at the very least, close quote. The more we thrash about in attempts to escape the situation, the more it becomes thoroughgoing impasse, Sister Fitzgerald writes, and forces the end of our habitual ways of acting and thinking. Neither reason nor logic either careful analysis nor meticulous planning can resolve the matter or lead to solutions. What is needed, she writes, is, quote, acknowledgement of our powerlessness, close quote, coupled with the practice and posture of openness, of waiting, and of, quote, revolutionary patience, close quote, for what cannot be demanded. The unexpected, the alternative, or the new vision lies just beyond our conscious, rational control and recedes at every attempt to wrest control of it. Still, our existential and societal experience is not new. Fitzgerald reminds us, quote, Christian spirituality remains attentive to the centrality of the self, to stages of faith development, to passages, to crises of growth in one's search for God and human wholeness. It reaches moreover with particular urgency in our own time for the integration of contemplation and social commitment, close quote. By attending humbly to the movement of God in our lives, shifting our focus from the dichotomous demands of technical rationality and mastery, waiting, listening, and learning silence, we prepare ourselves for education in contemplation, the appropriation of our interiority. Indeed, Sister Fitzgerald states simply that through con contemplation, our broken world, quote, will be freed, healed, changed, brought to paradoxical new visions, and freed for nonviolence, selfless, liberating action, freed therefore for community on this planet Earth, close quote. Further, she acknowledges that most of us think such fundamental change impossible. But she asserts, we can no longer, quote, afford to bypass contemplation, interiority, or desire for God as though they were esoteric experiences for the lazy or unbalanced elite, but not for us who value above all reason sanity, and the ability to control our destinies. Certainly without contemplative prayer and the transformation it really can effect, the deepest dimension of the human person and of humanity itself lies forever dormant and beyond our reach. But even more, without it, the true evolutionary possibilities completely dependent on the inbuilt purpose and aspirations of the human soul are beyond us. This is the era of contemplation and the stakes are very high. We need to understand and to speak, therefore, of the unleashed power, influence, and freedom of contemplative love and wisdom, of their ability to pass beyond the limits by which both person and humanity are confined, the boundaries within which human consciousness, desire, culture, evolution and religion are now enclosed, close quote. A very long and rich passage. Such though is the vision of a civilized human being, of Christian spirituality, of mysticism, to which Constance Fitzgerald invites us. 
This call to contemplation is a call to integral self-understanding, but it is neither esoteric nor arcane. Rather, she assures us that in the Carmelite tradition, quote, the prayer that leads to the divine embrace of contemplative communion and transformation is a relationship developed day by day through fidelity to a presence that pervades every facet of our lives and whose image can be found etched in the length and breadth of the world, close quote. Moreover, contemplation is not a validation of things as they are, even if loving and peaceful, it is not passive waiting. Rather, Sister Fitzgerald encourages us to grasp contemplation as, quote, a constant questioning and restlessness that waits for and believes in the coming of a transformed vision of God, a new and integrating spirituality, close quote, capable of envisioning and bringing about in the concrete new politics, new economies, capable of renewing culture, of generating compassionate and differentiated and differentiated ways of understanding, thinking about, appreciating, and relating to being, capable of creating new social institutions, configurations, and patterns, capable of opening us in compassionate solidarity to all human persons, to the entire created order. On this feast day with John at the Cross, in hope, we peer into the dark, almost without sight, darkness far and wide. No sign for us to mark, no other light, no guide, except for our hearts, the fire, the fire who burns inside. Thank you. Grazie mille. Thank you. Thank you very much for your passionate and insightful lecture, Sean. Um, I will uh, shift from English to Tanya from now on in order to uh, allow people, Italian people, to understand. Um, your three part argument has shown us first what we mean by civilization. Second, what lies behind this too often self-indulgent image of modern civilization. And finally, what might be a spiritual way out of the impasse. Quindi, per riassumere la riflessione di Sean nella sua lezione, eh, ci sono tre passaggi che lei ha sviluppato. Che cosa intendiamo generalmente per civiltà, che cosa si nasconde in rea nella realtà, in, dietro l'immagine troppo spesso autoindulgente che abbiamo della nostra civiltà moderna e nell'ultimo passaggio eh, che cosa potrebbe rappresentare appunto una via di uscita spirituale da questo stallo, da questa condizione di impasse. Um, let's see if there are questions from the audience um, while we wait for them i may break the eyes myself and ask you the first question if you don't mind of course um you yourself <laughs> have noted that christian spirituality requires a certain dose of passivity of giving up to an external source of truth, beauty, and justice. I mean, it is not pure activism, but neither is it a form of resignation or fatalism, uh, sort of let it be. It is, so to speak, a paradoxical form of active passivity. Could you tell us something more about it, given that one of the problems that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to the fore is precisely the fragility of the modern rage for order and mastery and control. So if you want to say something more about this important notion of the sort of passive activity or active passivity, yes, it's... Um... Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. 
very much. Uh, I think one of the one of the ways of thinking about this um, is to raise the question: How is it that in our attempt to understand what's happening to us as humans and to act in such a way that both honors the largest dimension, most fundamental dimension of who we are as spirit. That in that effort, uh, yes, we face an impasse because we want to act. And yet sometimes our actions not only complicate, but undo the very intentions that we have. So the, the spiritual tradition, Christianity, like other world religions or other religions of the world, uh, no matter where they are located by place, um, the spirit always moves. That, uh, in fact, um, Christianity has a rich tradition of spiritualities in the plural. I'm suggesting one, and it's not one that's in fact ignored in the modern or postmodern, if you like, world. That is the concern for contemplation, uh, for the quietness um, that allows us to discern what in fact is a right course or a better course of action. So that, uh, in fact, um, you describe it well, either an active passivity or a passivity of action. Uh, we have in this way an opportunity to begin to reflect both on our own uh, understanding, both on our, on our own understanding, to reflect on our own judgments and our own actions and decisions in such a way that in fact, we become self-critical. This is a, a word perhaps that we recognize in, in our modern activist uh, moment. What is the self-critique? But, but this comes, I think, with a larger demand uh, of thinking about the other, having encountered the face of the other, how do I respond? What, how do I respond to the demands that are placed on me by that encounter? So this is not a spirituality though for the faint-hearted. Uh, I think it requires a certain discipline like other, spirituality, other spiritual practices. I'm not suggesting necessarily bodily uh, practices, but, but practices of mind and heart. And I think that, uh, that is very, um, it's crucial. There is a, a philosopher, uh, Philip McShane, who uh, lives in Canada. He has a wonderful phrase, living with minding. And he challenges us because we live without minding. We live without paying attention. We live without understanding. We carry what is preconceived in our own minds forward and simply run roughshod. This would be my interpretation, run roughshod over the reality we encounter rather than pause, rather than pause. So there is a way in which concern, at least here in the United States, and I don't think it's, re it's, con it's restricted to us or to the English speaking uh, intellectual world at all, uh, there is a concern for contemplative practice. There's a, con a concern for asking our students to slow down and to, to think, to reflect. It, it has homeliness, homely wisdom about it. Think before you act, uh, look before you leap. But it's far more than that because it's not simply uh, inward looking, looking inward, navel gazing, as we say frequently in English, but it's turning inward in order to turn outward, turning inward in order to turn outward in the best possible way that we can. Does this begin to, to approximate something of a response to 
to your question. Thank you. And, uh, and I translate your answer in Italian. So, la mia domanda era relativa alla concezione della spiritualità cristiana eh, a cui Sean ha fatto riferimento nella parte conclusiva della sua, della sua lecture e, appunto, e notavo come eh, questa spiritualità è una spiritualità un po' paradossale perché richiede una certa forma di passività anche diciamo così di abbandono a una fonte esterna di verità, bellezza e giustizia non è una forma di puro attivismo ma non è neanche una forma eh, di rassegnazione o di fatalismo una sorta di let it be mh, vago e generico e, e dicevo appunto le chiedevo appunto se questo tipo di paradosso questa forma questa forma eh, paradossale di eh, una passività attiva eh, insomma si poteva dirci qualcosa insomma per chiarire questa natura e mh, nella sua risposta Uh, Sean ha insistito proprio su questo aspetto uh, che, diciamo così, il, um, il, la fonte di questa spirita, spiritualità cristiana è un'esperienza molto familiare per molti di noi, no? è, è il fatto che appunto, noi abbiamo il desiderio di agire, di raggiungere determinati obiettivi, abbiamo paura no? spesso di non raggiungerli e proprio questa con stato d'animo spesso ci fa in un certo senso una specie di sgambetto, no? non riusciamo ad arrivare proprio dove avremmo voluto andare, quindi è un'esperienza di uno scacco. No? E mh, il cristianesimo, appunto, nelle sue forme di spiritualità, il plurale, ha cercato di dare una, 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 una risposta a questa condizione di stallo, che è una condizione di stallo, diciamo così, della persona che agisce. E, e alcune di queste correnti di spiritualità hanno insistito molto, diciamo, sulla cura per la contemplazione. E, diciamo, sicuramente l'elemento appunto contemplativo, il ripiegarsi no, verso l'interno, verso la propria interiorità, è sicuramente importante e questa caratteristica appunto ha la caratteristica spesso di produrre una forma di autocritica, no? è un riflettere eh, sui propri eh, giudizi, e, però appunto eh, Sean ha insistito molto sul fatto che questo esercizio di autoriflessione non è fine a se stesso, ma è determinato, è spinto, originato, motivato da un incontro con l'altro. Mm? Eh, e, e proprio per questo... Eh, Sean ha detto appunto che questa non la si può definire appunto una spiritualità per i deboli di cuore, no? ha una sua um, dimensione insomma, quasi atletica, potremmo dire, insomma, no? è una pratica di, eh, concreta, di presa in cura dell'altro. No? E infatti eh, citava questa frase che secondo lei riassume molto bene questa condizione di spiritualità che è appunto vivere prestando attenzione prestando attenzione agli altri, curarsi degli altri e ha concluso Sean notando come negli Stati Uniti ma questo è vero anche per l'Italia c'è una attenzione diffusa tra i giovani e soprattutto per la, per la contemplazione, per la mindfulness per forme diciamo così di recupero della dimensione in interiore, però eh, appunto, il, suo, eh, il suo invito e il punto centrale della sua osservazione è che questo non può significare appunto ripiegarsi su se stessi eh, osservando il proprio ombelico, eh, ma appunto è un guardarsi dentro per rivolgersi fuori e quindi l'attenzione per l'alterità. Uh, I see now some questions uh, in English. Uh, come from, um, I, I don't know from whom, but I read the question. Anthropologist Margaret Mead believed that the first sign of civilization in an ancient culture was not hooks, pots, pots of mud, or grinding stones, but a broken and healed femur, a, a bone. Yeah. No animal survives a broken leg long enough to heal the bone. The broken femur that has healed is proof that someone took the time to be with the one who fell, bandaged the wound, took him to a safe place and helped me recover. 
Mead said, helping someone else in trouble is where civilization uh, begins. This recalls of the parable uh, uh, and then is. It's probably the, it might be the parable of the Good Samaritan. Yeah, the Good the Samaritan. Samaritan yes. yeah. And I think, well, maybe uh, he or she wants you to think about this. Uh, um, Margaret Mead idea. Uh, yes. I translate the question. Uh, la domanda um, in questo caso parte da un'osservazione famosa che è molto circolata in questo periodo di pandemia. Secondo Margaret Mead, l'antropologa, la, il primo segno della civiltà appunto non è tanto un artefatto, un prodotto tecnico, ma la scoperta di un osso uh, um, guarito, di un femore in questo caso. Eh, guarito perché appunto per poter guarire da una frattura a una gamba significa che qualcuno ha avuto il tempo per occuparsi di questa persona e diciamo e questa idea eh, collega eh, l'idea di civiltà all'idea appunto espressa nella parabola del buon samaritano per cui eh, il centro diciamo così della civiltà e la solidarietà civility and solidarity seems to go together so exactly exactly um... I'm just leaning forward so that I can uh, get a better uh, grip on the question myself to see it. Uh, of course, uh, healing uh, would be the point, taking the time to bandage um, uh, a wound uh, to help. And yes, uh, the questioner continues uh, with the, good, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I think, I think this is right. This is part of my insistence on solidarity here, that in fact, we need to recover a sense of compassion. And it is not as if there are no signs of it in our world today. Uh, I think, uh, for instance, uh, some of the first reports in the United States uh, about uh, the lockdown caused by the virus are the reports that came to us from Italy were people making music for other people Uh, as nurses and physicians uh, came home from work, uh, showing, in fact, a gesture of compassionate thanks. It's a recognition of what people may very well have been going through in hospitals and in healthcare clinics and so on. So yes, uh, compassion is crucial. And we are able to reach out in compassion once we have slowed down once we have placed ourselves in a situation in which we are not so quick to act, but are ready, in fact, to receive and to receive deeply from our own interior what it is that wells up in us to reach out to, to others. I think, I think, yes, we can discover our capacities for compassion and enhance those uh, capacities by learning contemplation, something that we need to learn. And so, yes, I, 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 totally, I totally agree with, with the questioner, of course. Um, and what, what the issue at stake for the Samaritan uh, is really the Samaritan thinks of the other, not of what will happen to himself But what would happen if I left the person wounded alone? What would happen if I left the person with the broken femur alone? So, so yes, I, 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 healing and compassion. And we are seeing this in our world, the sacrifices that are being made by nurses and physicians and technicians and specialists of all sorts. Thank you. Sine, la sua risposta la professoressa Copland um, ha sottolineato anche lei il legame stretto che esiste tra eh, la solidarietà e mh, la civiltà, in particolare come già nella sua lezione um, um, ha sostenuto, in particolare il senso di compassione no? verso, verso gli altri. E, mh, e, mh, alcuni segni, diciamo così, di questa capacità di entrare empaticamente in relazione con gli altri si sono già registrati durante questa, questa, questa emergenza sanitaria. 
perché diciamo così, venissero a galla, perché si manifestassero, abbiamo dovuto tutti rallentare, aggiungerei io anche diciamo così, riscoprire l'importanza di alcune professioni di cura che erano rimaste un po' invisibili o ai margini eh, in precedenza, e l'altra cosa su cui insisteva molto è che questa capacità appunto di provare compassione, di creare i presupposti per la, per la, per la solidarietà dipendono appunto dal fatto da una, da una relazione che possiamo intrattenere con una dimensione contemplativa dell'esistenza. Eh, appunto, come diceva anche Percenero, questa dimensione di autocritica emerge attraverso la cura degli altri e quindi diciamo così la verità della parabola del buon samaritano sta proprio nel fatto che il motivo per cui eh, il buon samaritano agisce compassivamente, com in maniera compassionevole, certo dipende da una sua reazione emotiva, ma allo stesso tempo dal suo pensiero che si attiva mh, nel provare la compassione sulla sorte che toccherà l'altro nel caso in cui appunto eh, gli venisse a mancare l'aiuto. E quindi ecco, insomma, il, il punto centrale <coughs> è proprio questa relazione stretta che esiste tra l'azione compassionevole e, eh, e la vita in comune, la socialità, la civiltà. Um, if I could add that uh, the lecture in some way is an indirect uh, affirmation, it could be made more directly, but an indirect affirmation of the significance of compassion. I mean, this is really uh, the teaching, isn't it, not of uh, the Dalai Lama, uh, about the significance and importance of compassion in the world, um, extending ourselves. And, and yes, I think that the statistics that I shared are clearly a proof of a lack of compassion and a necessary, that compassion is a necessary element, a necessary element in our world. Certo, sì, appunto, eh, l'importanza della compassione si può anche dimostrare, diciamo così, ex negativo e nella, diciamo, in un certo senso nella lecture questo è stato mostrato eh, attraverso anche semplicemente un'osservazione delle ingiustizie, delle disuguaglianze eh, così presenti nel nostro mondo che sono lì ad attestare la nostra mancanza di compassione e quindi appunto un po' come, eh, come l'andamento stesso, diciamo, della, della lecture ha mostrato, c'è una dialettica, diciamo, nella nostra civiltà dove, dove eh, la, il progresso eh, della civiltà non va sempre di pari passo con il progresso, eh, diciamo così, della solidarietà e della compassione, eh, sostanzialmente, appunto, eh, ehm, smentendo l'importanza che invece per esempio un leader spirituale come il Dalai Lama eh, attribuisce appunto alla nostra capacità di provare compassione per gli altri. Quindi, appunto, eh, our director, uh, Professor Ventura, wants to ask you a question, a very short uh, question. What can organized religions do here? Che cosa possono fare appunto le... Eh, eh, le istituzioni religiose, insomma, eh, per andare nella direzione di una civiltà eh, più sostenibile, appunto, è la domanda del direttore Marco Ventura. I think uh, there are obvious uh, answers in this way that we recognize both the uh, attention not of all of all organized religions. Um, I cannot speak uh, for all organized religions. I can make some general gestures, but I think we all recognize, um, certainly uh, I can recognize about Christianity um, mm -hmm. and certainly uh, Christianity in the Western world, whatever that means uh, today, uh, that, that Christianity has preoccupied itself, unfortunately, uh, with, with too much concern for um, security and safety and finding too much security and safety in economic and political alliances. Um, perhaps I'm speaking of Christianity in the United States, uh, perhaps 
Others may say that Christianity in other places uh, takes a very different, uh, a different tact. Uh, but, but I would say that, that a, a reformation of the priorities of certainly organized institutional Christianity in its various streams, since there is not just one stream, um, that a kind of self-examine of conscience um, about the demand of the gospel, uh, what does it mean to, uh, to bring the gospel to those whom Jesus identifies in Matthew 25 as members of his family, uh, all those who are uh, reviled, uh, excluded, uh, who are hungry, who are poor, who come looking for uh, compassion, who come looking for, for shelter, and perhaps are greeted um, in very different ways. So, so I would I would suggest that if someone who is in charge of some official institutional religion, um, some institutional form of Christianity, might begin with uh, encouraging us all to examine our consciences about how is it that we respond to the gospel command, how is it that we respond uh, to the good news of bringing um, word of the kingdom of God. Um, which, which has to begin within us, which is the point about recovering a sense of spirit and spirituality for ourselves, a new kind of spirituality that um, allows us to go deep into our own interior and to meet ourselves in a, in a totally new way before God. I mean, this is, of course, this is a theologian speaking uh, in this sense. I'm not speaking as a social scientist, but, but I think social science can help us understand how effective or ineffective uh, we have been as organized religions. So uh, thinking, again, of Christianity in the West, there is a, there's a set of questions we should ask ourselves, a way in which we ask about how it is that we live. What do we live for? What do we act for? Security and safety, or do we act with the reckless abandon of God uh, in offering ourselves to those who are most disenfranchised or dispossessed in our society? That, that, would, be, that would be a preliminary response, a preliminary response. Thank you, thank you. Um, rispetto alla questione di eh, che cosa possono fare le religioni organizzate, le istituzioni religiose per, per um, eh, appunto, eh, fare, eh, per, um, fare dei passi avanti nella direzione di una società più compassionevole, eh, la professoressa Copland notava ovviamente che parlare... No, Appunto, le istituzioni religiose sono molte, le, religiose, le religioni organizzate sono molte e dalla prospettiva, diciamo così, del cristianesimo latino, cristianesimo occidentale, il eh, suo è un invito a fare un'autocritica, no? a riconoscere i limiti delle religioni istituzionali e soprattutto eh, il principale di questi limiti è la eccessiva cura, attenzione, preoccupazione per la dimensione della sicurezza, della propria sicurezza, della sicurezza della propria istituzione religiosa che ha condotto, che ha spinto a cercare delle alleanze politiche, quindi in una, forma, una sorta di realismo politico che ha finito, diciamo così, per penalizzare invece la ricerca, diciamo così, il perseguimento dei fini eh, fondamentali del Vangelo. Quindi diciamo, è una, anche in questo caso l'invito è quello a fare una sorta di autocritica che conduca anche in questo caso ad una, innanzitutto ad una trasformazione spirituale in cui uno riflette sull'ordine delle proprie priorità, ne ridefinisce l'ordine, in questo caso il criterio per ridefinire questo ordine è l'ordine di priorità che si ritrova nel Vangelo e quindi alla fine anche il criterio è la realizzazione del Regno di Dio. Anche in questo caso, appunto, eh, il professor Issa Copland sottolineava, ehm, c'è eh, 
una spinta, una, una spinta importante verso una nuova forma di spiritualità che si deve accompagnare ad una trasformazione della dimensione pratica e istituzionale. I want to read you a short message from Davide's wife and son Federico. Uh, she wants to thank you and thank us for this event and for this opportunity to honor the memory of David. Um, I have another question. Glauco D'Agostino um, would like to um, report a, a reflection on what the Algerian philosopher Mustafa Sharif writes, European societies are the first in history to want to live disconnected from a spiritual transcendence. Um, and so maybe it wants you to uh, mm -hmm. think about this uh, yes. disconnection. Yes. This yes. form of radical secularization in a sense. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, this is uh, the whole notion of technical rationality, that we prefer uh, what we can see and control Uh, our empiricism uh, drives us all. Uh, we want to be practical and do. And so uh, the kind of stillness, the kind of silence and quiet that makes us available to the movement of the spirit's action is, is precisely what we've been, it's a spot on uh, uh, observation, it's, a, it's spot on. Um, or in some parts of the West, we are very keen on religion, to bring these two, the last two questions together a bit, we are very keen on religion, we want to be involved in religion, but we want to manipulate it to our purposes. And so we want to, rather than have um, ourselves pulled towards something transcendent, we want to bring that transcendence to ourselves and remake it in our own image. And this is, this is part of what Vaclav Havel is trying to say in, in the quote I read. It's also an observation we could make about, uh, certainly I could make about uh, the function of some dimensions of religious practice in the United States. We want to make ourselves into idols as opposed to uh, submit ourselves to the gospel. Um, because the gospel is not something for Christians simply to read, uh, to hear weekly, it is something to live. And this becomes the deep challenge, I think, the great challenge, the problematic challenge for us. Thank you, thank you. Um, non ho prima forse tradotto il, il messaggio di Lucilla, la moglie di Davide e anche di Federico, suo figlio, che ringraziava per questa... Uh, questo evento, questa occasione uh, per ricordare uh, Davide, il suo lavoro. E la domanda che ho fatto, su, credo solo in inglese, era di Glauco D'Agostino, che um, chiedeva a Sean Copeland di riflettere su una uh, affermazione del filosofo algerino Mustafa Sharif, che uh, dice che le società europee sono le prime società nella storia che desiderano, hanno, desiderano vivere appunto Uh, disconnesse dalla dimensione della trascendenza spirituale e Sean Copeland ha messo in evidenza, eh, cioè, ha detto che questo è vero, no? E un po' si ricollega alle um, riflessioni che abbiamo fatto oggi sul bisogno di questa dimensione di tranquillità, di silenzio e di quiete per poter accedere ad una dimensione anche pratica, autocritica. Però lei ha messo in evidenza un paradosso perché nella nostra società ci sono entrambi gli aspetti, cioè. C'è in realtà ancora un legame forte con la religione, però la religione viene utilizzata come un mezzo di potenziamento per l'essere umano, piuttosto appunto come diciamo, un'occasione un per rinunciare no, a delle pretese di eh, 
governare, di padroneggiare il mondo. Quindi la religione, l'appello anche alla religione, alla trascendenza, è orientato tutto a degli scopi mondani. Si vuole usare la trascendenza per potenziare noi stessi. No? E la grande sfida, secondo, secondo eh, eh, Shone, invece è proprio quella di vivere no? il contenuto eh, diciamo così, del messaggio religioso e di questo invito a collegarsi con la sfera, la dimensione della trascendenza ad un livello più profondo appunto, rispetto a questo livello che ci riconduce appunto come, come un po' a, 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 come ha sottolineato appunto a, nella, sua, nella sua lezione, riconduce sempre a questa dimensione della civiltà che è una dimensione che è allo stesso tempo civile e incivile allo stesso tempo. Um, oh, there are a lot of questions now. I try to um, not to get lost in uh, this flood of question. There's a one, I'm, I'm, I'm reading some of them so that you can pick up the one that you want to answer. The first one is the Good Samaritan belong to a category of people considered excluded from the salvation coming from the Jews. Is it perhaps from the excluded of this world that we can hope for a better civilization? Qui la domanda ha a che fare con eh, sempre la parabola del buon samaritano e, e su un dettaglio insomma della parabola, cioè il fatto che il buon samaritano appartiene lui stesso ad una categoria di persone che sono ai margini della società e quindi ci si chiede appunto se, se non possiamo se non dobbiamo aspettarci eh, la salvezza per la nostra civiltà proprio dai, dai margini. Um, um, Ruggero Morandi eh, chiede eh, spiritualità e impegno politico, cura del creato, fraternità, sono i nuovi cardini del Magistero di Papa Francesco. Cosa dice questo a sostegno della civiltà? There is a reference to Pope Francis, of course, in his role, charismatic role today, precisely in the direction that you um, pointed to in your lecture and Giorgio Morandi wants to uh, know your uh, opinion about it. And then the last one is um, uh, from Michele Fedrizzi. Uh, grazie professor Copland per la sua esposizione. Sono rimasto colpito da una sua iniziale descrizione relativa alla forzata unità che prima la consapevolezza di appartenenza ad un sistema globalizzato e soprattutto a seguito della percezione di uno stato di sofferenza globalizzato che vedo afferente alla parte spirituale delle coscienze eh, purtroppo ciò si contrappone alla continua alimentazione di senso di insicurezza e paura da parte di chi governa ovvero detiene poteri economici There, um, Michele Federizzi is uh, mentioning this uh, precisely this dialectic between um, the, um, the Uh, this global um, uh, economic, uh, the economy, the global economy, the globalization is a form of connecting people, but at the same time, uh, as you said, um, pushing them against each other. So the, the, the sort of contradiction you, you mentioned at the beginning of your lecture. So I give you the floor for the, this last minutes of our conversation and Yes. And then I will conclude. Thank you. Well, uh, in terms of uh, salvation coming from the excluded, this is, of course, what uh, uh, theologians uh, who have committed themselves to liberation theologies uh, have been trying to uh, help us rediscover uh, over the last uh, 40 or so years. Uh, they've been trying to remind us um, Uh, to be able to present ourselves selflessly and authentically and humbly uh, to be of service uh, to others. And this is precisely the task of, um, of the challenge of liberation uh, theology. Um, yes, uh, globalization is, uh, is an ambiguous uh, term and it's an ambiguous experience. We are brought together and yet we are homogenized And in that homogenization, there's a kind of forcedness. And what we worry about, of course, is the point uh, that I tried to make with uh, uh, this uh, reference to Huntington. We are not looking for assimil assimilation, 
but finding what uh, what what the uh, Dominican order of the Catholic Church calls unity in difference, that we are trying hard to be together out of our essential humanity and our essential uh, oneness uh, to be together as human beings. And finally, I think um, with regard to uh, to Pope Francis, Viva Papa Francesco, uh, Viva Papa Francesco, uh, I think he's trying very hard to uh, help the church not be uh, so much of a corporation, but a field hospital, as he uses that image, for those who are wounded and excluded. And that includes those of us who are also materially comfortable. We too are wounded. We too are in some ways in need of uh, great and deep spiritual direction. Um, so yes, I, 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 I'm honored to be considered thinking with the Pope, uh, thinking with this Pope. Uh, uh, since we're going to conclude, let me please uh, say, first of all, thank you uh, to the family uh, of David Zordan for their kind comments and for their interest uh, in this lecture and their support of it. Um, to thank uh, Professor Venturi, your president, uh, to thank uh, you uh, truly, uh, Paolo, for your kindness, uh, for your um, probably preparing better answers uh, in Italian uh, than the ones that are given in English. And uh, I thank again, uh, Signora Masse and your staff for all your kindness uh, in the preparation of this lecture. and. Uh, it is an honor to be able to give it and to be with you virtually in Trento. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sean. I'm translating. Uh, parto dalla fine. Um, uh, Sean ha ringraziato innanzitutto uh, Cile Federico e comunque tutta la famiglia di Davide per, uh, per, le, per le loro parole e per il sostegno che danno a questa, a questa lecture, a questa iniziativa uh, che lei apprezza molto e si sente onorata di aver partecipato e i suoi ringraziamenti si estendono a tutti noi che abbiamo uh, contribuito all'organizzazione dal direttore Marco Ventura a, a Isabella Masè che eh, si è occupata appunto di tutti i dettagli organizzativi e, e, e per quanto riguarda invece le, le risposte alle domande eh, parto anche in questo caso dalla fine Um, Sean in maniera molto simpatica ha detto viva Papa Francesco eh, sostenendo appunto che di fatto lui incarna esattamente quello spirito di riforma a cui faceva riferimento ha fatto riferimento in più passi della, sia della sua lecture se, sia delle sue risposte e la cosa appunto interessante che diceva appunto che questa riforma ovviamente che va nella direzione del prendersi cura dell'altro è a 360 gradi perché riguarda le persone che stanno ai margini della società però riguarda anche noi che siamo nel centro eh, di questa società ma che siamo spesso appunto anche noi spiritualmente deprivati appunto. quindi è una compassione a 360 gradi per quanto riguarda il carattere ambivalente della, della, della globalizzazione, sì, conferma quello che ha detto anche nella sua lecture, l'obiettivo dovrebbe essere appunto non tanto quello di rinchiudersi nelle proprie piccole patrie, ma di sviluppare una concezione plurale della modernità, appunto come diceva lei, appunto come una forma di unità nella differenza in cui la globalizzazione non sia la riduzione ad un uno, ma invece la valorizzazione eh, appunto pacifica, no? nella pace delle differenze culturali, e questo ha a che fare appunto anche con la questione del conflitto, presunto conflitto di civiltà eh, sostenuto da Huntington. Per quanto riguarda la parabola del buon samaritano, anche in questo caso conferma sì che certo appunto eh, eh, la salvezza in questa, eh, per, la civiltà, per la nostra civiltà non potrà che giungere dagli esclusi, è una lezione che abbiamo già cominciato ad imparare appunto anche eh, in teologia, con le teologie, la teologia della liberazione, però appunto ovviamente questa ri rappresenta eh, una grande sfida e comprensibilmente perché ehm, ovviamente i margini e, i cen e il centro, diciamo così, appunto... <ride> non rappresentano due assoluti, no? possono anche, appunto, sono in tensione continua 
e riuscire diciamo così, a far sopravvivere le virtù dei margini senza che non diventino i difetti del centro è la vera sfida eh, non solo teologica ma per, per, tutti, per tutti noi so it's, it's now time to say goodbye and uh, well time flies in this uh, when the conversation is so good and I personally want to thank Sean Copeland once more for being with us today and I also thank our director Marco Ventura for his unfailing support to the lecture. My gratitude extends to Isabella Mazet too, who has been the true director of this event in every sense of the word. Thanks also to Annalisa Armani for helping us with the Italian subtitles. I hope that you will join us for the next edition of the Zordon lecture as well. In the meantime, I'm glad to inform you that the Italian translation of Clive Marsh's 2018 lecture has been published, recently published. Its title is Si salva chi può, chi non può, modi attuali di intendere la salvezza. Please continue to follow the online events organized by the Center for Religious Studies next year. The main one is the series of webinars, Artificial Intelligence and Religion, which has already reached its seventh episode and will continue until April. Good evening, everybody. Buonasera a tutti. Io ho ringraziato tutte le persone coinvolte. Ovviamente un ringraziamento particolarmente caloroso e alla nostra relatrice Sean Copeland, ma il nostro direttore Marco Ventura per il sostegno al Zordon Lecture, Isabella Mazet, che ha diretto questo evento in ogni senso della parola. Anna Disarmani si è occupata dei sottotitoli. Vi aspettiamo per la Zordan Lecture dell'anno prossimo. Eh, è stato pubblicato da pochi eh, mesi eh, il terzo eh, episodio della Zordan Lecture, la lezione tenuta da Clive Marsh. Il titolo di questo libricino è Si salva chi non può, modi attuali di intendere la salvezza. Continuate a seguire eh, gli eventi che per il momento sono ancora tutti eventi online organizzati dal Centro per le Scienze Religiose. Eh, attualmente il principale evento è la serie di webinars Artificial Intelligence and Religion. Eh, siamo arrivati al settimo episodio e la serie continuerà fino ad aprile. Grazie di cuore a tutti, grazie a Marco Ventura. Grazie. E, um, thank you, Sean, again. Um, Auguri per le festività, auguri a tutti. Thank you. Thank all your listeners, all the questions. Thank you. Grazie in effetti a Grazie. tutti coloro che hanno fatto domande al pubblico intero. Buona serata. Buona sera.